to be out this evening to ask the question, Jesus and Muhammad, did they preach the same message? Now, the debate tonight will center on whether we will allow the New Testament to define Jesus' teaching, or whether we will insist upon placing it in some other context and denying its own internal consistency and harmony, and you've already seen that. Uh, historically, the only way to know what Jesus taught is to look at what was recorded in the first century about Jesus Christ and his teaching, and that is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the only sources that exist that came from the first century and that came from the context of uh, Second Temple Judaism in which Jesus lived and preached. The message of Jesus is defined by the consistent testimony of the scriptures that come from the first century and were written by his initial followers, not by later writings of the following centuries. That, I think, is just given by the fact of logic. Now, Jesus confessed in that material that there was one true God. He often quoted the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Here in Israel, Yahweh is our God. Yahweh is one. Jesus taught God's law was good and unabrogated. In fact, he taught anyone who teaches you to not observe this law is the least in the kingdom of heaven. Of course, he also taught that he was the fulfillment of that law. Jesus taught his followers to pray. He taught his followers to give alms, to do good for the poor, to honor their father and their mother. Jesus was a Jewish prophet, and he addressed concerns of Second Temple Judaism. All these things would find parallels in Muhammad's teachings or in the teachings of the Jewish rabbis of Jesus' day. But to limit or even define Jesus' teachings by these things misses the whole point of the Gospels in the New Testament. You see, my friends, there was a reason why Jesus was in conflict with the Jewish leaders from the very start of his ministry. And that's the same reason why the Quran seeks to warn Christians against excess in their deen, in their religion, in Surah 4, 171. Now, one question to keep in mind this evening. What evidence is there that the author of the Quran had any knowledge at all of the content and meaning of the Christian gospel? I've never had a Muslim substantiate the idea that the author of the Quran actually knew what was in the New Testament so as to make any meaningful commentary upon it. Now, I understand from the Orthodox Islamic perspective, well, the author of the Quran was Allah himself. Well, all of the historians that uh, Adnan just quoted would never accept that as a given. Not a single one of them. James D.G. Dunn wouldn't. He would say, no, we need to look at the author in the context in which he was writing. And is there any evidence that the author of the Quran even knew what the Gospels said about Jesus? That he even knew that there were Gospels? There's no evidence of that. The only verse cited directly from the Bible in the Quran is the Lex Talionis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. There's one other possible text from the Psalms, but there are even Muslim scholars that dispute whether that's the case. There is no evidence that the author of the Quran had any direct knowledge of what the New Testament actually teaches so as to respond to it. And so I just simply have to make a, a, a plea. The Quran talks about having equal weights and fair scales. Now the immediate application of that was in business, do what's right, be fair. But I think we can make a broader application of that, and Muslim writers have, the fact that Muslims should be truthful, they should use equal standards. And I submit to you that the application of naturalistic materialism and that worldview to either the Quran or the New Testament is going to result in a degradation of those texts and an interpretation of those texts that is completely different than their authors intended. And it's my submission to you that already this evening, Adnan has used scholarship and conclusions he would never allow to be applied to the Quran, but he's applied it to the New Testament. And that is unfair. It is a violation of the Quran itself, which says to argue in a way that is best. Some translations say a way that is fair. We must use the same standards. And so to a Muslim this evening, I say, you must use the same standards you use to defend the Quran to criticize my New Testament and the Gospel. You must, or you're using different standards. We must avoid anachronism as well. You cannot make the Quran the standard, then look back over history and say, well, if it doesn't fit this. That's reading things backwards. 
That's not even the, the argument of Surah 5, which we'll get into another time. Now, if Adnan Rashid accepts the words of Jesus recorded in the Quran from 600 years later, without any textual evidence that they go back to Jesus himself, he must accept the words of Jesus in the Gospels from the first century on principle and logic. He must. If he says, well, I accept what the Quran says, but I will not accept what the Gospel of Mark says. So I'll accept something that has no textual history for 600 years, but I'll reject something that was written in the first century. That's not using fair scales, and we need to keep that in mind. Now, what was Jesus' message? Well, let's compare it with that of Muhammad. Really, that's the subject this evening. What was Jesus' message? Let's consider the testimony of the Gospel of Mark. Mark 1.1, 1, 1, we read the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, there's a text variant there. And if you look at the best evidence, there's very strong evidence that that is the great way that it originally read. We can look at the evidence if you want to. I have it all right here on my iPad. We can look at the entirety of it. It's something we Christians do. I've worked in textual criticism for decades now, and we're well aware of these things. But Jesus is described as the Son of God, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus is the very content of this message. It's not just something that was given to him and then he proclaimed to somebody else. He did that. But it's about him. That's the message. Prophets are given a message about somebody else. Prophets are never the subject of the message. In Mark 1.3, we have a quotation from the Old Testament about making ready the way of Yahweh. And it's being applied to Jesus. Now, very interestingly, uh, Adnan was talking about, well, they never would have understood the doctrine of the Trinity. The funny thing is... The New Testament writers, who all confess there's one true God, took that one name, Yahweh, and they applied it to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, and differentiated between each one. Why did they do that? What were they trying to communicate? They believed the Shema. They weren't denying the Shema. And yet they applied that one name of Yahweh to Father, Son, and to the Holy Spirit. In Mark 1.15, and saying, the time is filled. Here's Jesus preaching. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. What's the gospel again? The gospel of Jesus Christ. He is saying to repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel that is about Jesus. It's about what Jesus is teaching and Jesus is doing. Also in Mark chapter 1. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John the Jordan. Immediately coming out by the water, he saw the heavens open, the spirit like a dove descending upon him, and a voice came out of the heavens, You are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. Do Muslims believe that that happened? No. You can't. Jesus isn't the son. And here you have in the, and this is the same scholars that Adnan was quoting would say, this is one of the most primitive elements of the quote-unquote tradition. You have the Father speaking from heaven, the Spirit descending a dove, and this, and this person, Jesus, identified as the very Son of God, in whom God is well pleased. And we're only in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 1, verse 23. Just then there was a man in our synagogue with an unclean spirit. He cried out, saying, What business do we have with each other, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, and come out of him. Even the demons recognized who Jesus was. They didn't say, you're just a mere prophet. No, they said, you are the Holy One of God. They recognized that he was more than a mere prophet. In Mark 2, 5, when Jesus seeing their faith, he is the men who had lowered a paralytic down to Jesus through the roof, said, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And that is a proper question. Who can forgive sins but God alone? But Jesus forgave sins. And they weren't against him. And then he healed the man. Forgave him of his sins and healed him. And the people are amazed at the power and the authority that Jesus has. In Jesus, in John Mark 2, 27, Jesus said to them, The Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Jesus is the Son of Man. What does Son of Man mean? Son of Man could just mean a human. But that's not all the Son of Man means. In fact, we will see that there is a Son of Man in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, who appears before the Ancient of Days, and he has an everlasting kingdom, and his servants worship him with the highest form of worship. And that's who Jesus is identifying himself to be. And he says he's Lord of the Sabbath. Who established the Sabbath? 
Yahweh did. Jesus says, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. We're only in Mark chapter 2. We're not even in the Gospel of John, are we? Let's skip along because we don't have much time. Mark chapter 8, verse 34, and he summoned the crowd of his disciples and said to them, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Think about that for a moment. Jesus, a mere prophet? Lose your life for my sake. Take up your cross. Doesn't make much sense in light of Surah 417, does it? Except Surah 4, which stands against the entirety of history, and there's not a one person that I will quote this evening against the authority of the New Testament that would verify the Quran's denial of restriction. Not a one of them. In fact, I can quote the majority of them would say it's the most established fact of history. Beyond question. I'd be happy to debate that subject because history is all mine on that one. Anyways, whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. Life is dependent upon the gospel of Jesus Christ and following him. Does that sound like just a mere Jewish prophet? Mark 8, 38, For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Wow. Is this a mere prophet? Did Muhammad preach this Jesus? Where? Where? I've read all the Quran numerous times. I've read all of Bukhari and halfway through Muslim, I've read parts of Jamia Termini, and I can guarantee you, Muhammad didn't know this Jesus. Didn't know this Jesus. Didn't preach this message. Mark 9, 2. And Jesus was transfigured before them, and his garments became radiant, exceedingly white, as no longer an earth can whiten them. Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Here's Elijah. He represents the prophets. Moses representing the law. The law and the prophets are speaking with the fulfillment of them, Jesus. On the mountain of transfiguration, then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. Not, this is my beloved prophet. Jesus is a prophet, but he is much more than that. He is much more than that. Mark 9, 31, for he was teaching his disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered to the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. More than once, Jesus communicates this truth to his disciples. He says, I must go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man must be betrayed in the hands of men. And he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew the crucifixion was the very reason why he had come to voluntarily give his life and then to rise again on the third day. We stole the Gospel of Mark, and Jesus began to say as he taught in the temple, How is it that the scribes say that Christ, the Son of David? David himself said in the Holy Spirit, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies, I put your enemies beneath your feet. David himself calls him Lord, so in what sense is he his son? Here Jesus identifies, first of all, a quotation from Psalm 110 as being the very words of the Holy Spirit of God. Jesus' view of the Old Testament was, it's God breathed, and we still know what it was. And we know what the Torah, the Old Testament said in Jesus' day. And here, he's quoting from the Psalms. He's quoting from the Psalm about himself. Who is this, my Lord, the Lord said to my Lord? Who is David's Lord? Well, it's Jesus. He has to be greater than David. And he's applying that to himself, and we'll see. That's going to be very, very important. In John chapter 4, in Mark chapter 14. Here in chapter 14, a woman anoints Jesus and knows what Jesus says. She had done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of in memory of her. Jesus knew the gospel was for what? Israel? Yes, but for the whole world. And he knew he was going to die. He knew he was going to be buried. He knew he was going to rise again. And that that gospel would be preached throughout the whole world. So when he's brought before the high priest in John 14, listen to these words. The high priest stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, Do you not answer? What is it these men are testifying against you? He kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him, saying, Are you the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am. So much for I am being only in the Gospel of John. I am, and you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power. That's Psalm 110 again. And coming with the clouds of heaven. That's Daniel 7. That's the Son of Man figure that has people who worship him. Did Muhammad worship Jesus? No. 
Jesus has people who worship him. Latruo is the term. Who worship him. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, What further need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserve, deserving of death. The Jews knew what he was saying. They understood. Jesus didn't go, oh, no, 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 guys, you didn't understand. Well, I, I didn't mean that. They knew what he was claiming for himself and condemned him to death. And here's the text from Daniel chapter 7. I saw in the night visions, behold, the clouds of heaven became one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve Latruo, the highest form of worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. His kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. That was the text Jesus applied to himself. That was his teaching, and it was not Muhammad's. It was not Muhammad's. Jesus' message included himself as the king of the kingdom, as the divine son of man, as the unique son of God, whose gospel is the sole means of salvation for all men of all nations for all times. And I substantiated that from simply the gospel of Mark. I didn't even quote from John or Paul. I could have, didn't need to. This is the consistent testimony of the entirety of the New Testament. Muhammad did not preach this message, hence the debate thesis is decided. Because the question is, did Muhammad preach the same message as Jesus? The answer is, no, he did not. And if you want a beautiful example of it, look at this. In Surah, Surah 5, Surah Bamaya, verse 116, Allah says to Jesus, Did you say the people worship me and my mother as gods in derogation of all? Clearly showing that whoever wrote Surah 5, 116 did not understand the doctrine of the Trinity. Because that's not what Christians believe. But there you have it. And Jesus' response also is, if I had said it, you would have known it. You know what is within myself, and I do not know what is within yourself. Those words come from the 7th century. These words, Matthew 11 and 27, come from the 1st century, even by the most liberal dating. And there Jesus said, in the Synoptic Gospels, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal Him. Whoever wrote Sir 5116 either didn't know Matthew 11 27, that's my assumption, or rejected it. So here's the question this evening. What evidence do we have that Jesus said Matthew 11, 27? Well, from a historical perspective, historians will admit that we, don't, we, we cannot even begin to know what Jesus said if the Gospels are not a source for us. The author of the Quran told us that the Gospel, the Injil, was given to Jesus. That it had light and guidance. And that we, the people of the gospel, were to judge what was contained therein. Now that was in the 7th century. How could the people of the gospel judge by the gospel if the gospel had been destroyed in the 7th century? So if it existed in Muhammad's day, we know exactly what the New Testament read in its entirety in that, in that time period. We have entire copies of the New Testament that long predate the days of Muhammad. And so there's our question. The only way for Adnan to win the debate this evening is to deny what the New Testament teaches about Jesus' own words. So what does he give in the place? He quoted John 8, 54. One sentence later, Jesus said, Amen, Amen, Lego me. Then Abraham genestai ego I me. Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews pick up stones and stones. That was one sentence after what Adnan quoted as being from Jesus. So who's going to be consistent this evening? Who's going to use even scales? Whoever uses even scales will win the debate. That's what you need to be listening to. Thank you very much for your attention.